friends, it is a joy to be with you in worship on this Sunday morning, and I know that you may be accessing this worship service at different times during your week, but we are grateful that we can be connected in this way in a time in which we feel so disconnected. I do have a couple of announcements that I would like to offer. First of all, uh, immediately following our worship today, there will be a new Sunday School presentation that will be released that Cindy has put together. And this is really a Sunday School for the whole family. So we encourage you to take part in that following worship this morning. I also want to remind you that we continue to worship in the church, even though we are in smaller groups that are socially distanced and we're able to watch uh, worship together and participate in that way. I also want you to know that we're going to be trying something new next week, uh, that we are going to be having coffee hour following worship, and that will be via Zoom. So watch your email this week for an invitation to participate in coffee hour via Zoom, and we'll look forward to seeing how that works. Friends, I am excited this morning because we have the privilege of celebrating the sacrament of baptism. Chris and Chantel have worshiped with us for quite a while, and uh, their history goes even back further than that, but we're going to let them tell that as they introduce themselves in the baptism. But we have not been able to welcome them into worship, but we didn't want that to stand in the way of being able to baptize Atlas. So we're excited to do that this morning. Also, we have the privilege of celebrating together the birth of a child in our congregation. And I thought how sweet it is that following All Saints Sunday, where we celebrate those members of our church who have passed away in the last year, that this Sunday we get to celebrate a baptism and we get to celebrate the gift of new life in our congregation. Molly and Greg had a baby boy, so we will look forward when we can celebrate with them in person. But we wanted to introduce Lucien to you today, and so we are grateful to do that. And now would you please prepare your hearts for worship. This video's call to worship comes from Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and God's might and the wonders that the Lord has done. The word of the Lord.
despite God's clear commandments to us and gracious covenant with us. We often choose to serve the lesser gods of this world, those perishable, futile things which we make idols. An acknowledgement of our idolatry and our failings, rooting our hope in the love of the Lord and resting our faith in God's promise, uh, promises of mercy and forgiveness. Let us confess our sins to God by praying aloud the words on the screen. Loving God, as we examine our life together, our impulses and actions, we see all too clearly that our choices do not reflect your commandments. We fail to love you and we neglect to love our neighbors. You tell us to be ready to meet you at any moment, to stay awake to your presence, and to be prepared to do your will. But we remain distracted or complacent, disillusioned or paralyzed. We ask for your wisdom. Focus our attention on our Savior so that we might see your vision for this world and forgive our past mistakes so that we will be free to be the salt and light which you call and create us to be. Amen. Let's take a moment for silent confession. The first verse of Psalm 70 says, Be pleased, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Friends, let us believe the good news that God has answered this prayer and that through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. Do you know what it means to be prepared? Yeah, to get ready for something, to anticipate something happening, uh, maybe preparing for an emergency. There could be lots of things, but a lot of times we're called to be prepared, right? <laughs> and I am gonna be prepared today. Yep. I'm also gonna tell you about a parable a parable about being prepared. Uh, preparable? I don't know. Anyways, I'm going on a trip. Just a short trip, but I'm going all the way to the Twin Cities. So I am building a preparedness kit with my great green bag. And I wanna show you all the cool stuff I'm putting in it because 
you might want to have a bag for when you travel. So when I travel, I always put my headlamp in. That way, if I'm someplace and it's dark, I can see where I'm going, right? What else do I always put? Oh, I always put extra water in my preparedness bag. Yep. And, well, <laughs> hand sanitizer. Like to be nice and clean. Mm -hmm. um, I often take my sunglasses because it may be very sunny, like it is today. But because it might snow, it might snow, um, I'm gonna take a hat. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna take, let's see, what else? Oh, better take some coffee with me. Gotta take coffee. Oh, I better take an extra plug-in for my phone. Man, this bag's getting full. Um, a book? Ah, you never know when you're gonna get bored. So always have a book in your preparedness bag. And, oh yeah, the last thing, my toothbrush and toothpaste. I just like to be minty fresh all the time. <laughs> so I have a pretty good bag here and I am prepared to go to the Twin Cities, no matter what the weather is like. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus tells this story about 10 women. They are all brides and they're gonna get married soon and they are waiting for the bridegrooms to come. So what they do to wait, this is back in Jesus's time, they have a special lantern. Now I'm not sure what their lantern looked like. I have this lantern in my house. See how it has oil in the bottom? Yeah. So these 10 women had their lantern and they had their oil and they lit their lamp and they waited for the bridegroom. And they waited, and they waited. And some of them didn't really bring enough oil. They didn't bring any extra oil. They weren't very prepared for how long it might take before the bridegroom came. So they ran out of oil and their light went off. They tried to borrow some from the women who were prepared, but those women said, oh, no, you know, should have been prepared. So sure enough, don't you know the bridegroom show up and the ones that have the lamp can see them and get to go to the party and probably get married. But those ones that didn't have their light on, they missed out. Well, it's kind of an odd story for Jesus to tell, but he explains it to us. Here, let me put my lamp down, okay? He explains it to us. He says, guess what? The bridegroom is, that's a helicopter in the sky, so don't, don't mind that. The bridegroom is actually Jesus, me. And I am coming back for my bride. And a lot of times the Bible talks about the church as the bride. So Jesus is just telling them that I'm coming back for you, Christians, for the church. You have to wait for me and you have to be prepared. Some of them were, some of them weren't. And for those who weren't prepared, they missed out, which is really, really a bummer. But for those who were prepared, they could have a great celebration and be in the presence of Jesus. Now, that's a great story for us and something we need to take to heart. Because not only do I need to prepare for going to the cities, but we all need to prepare for what's to come. Jesus will come back. We know that because the scriptures tell us that. Now they don't tell us when, but we need to be prepared for that. It may be a long time. And so if it takes a long time, we need to be diligent and be prepared for the long haul so that when Jesus does come back, we're ready for him. Now, how do we be ready for him? Mm, lots of good ways, and I bet I hear you saying some of them. Right, we read our Bible every day. 
every day we read our Bible. You know what? That should be part of my preparedness bag. I think I'll go in and get a Bible before I leave. What else can we do? We can pray. We can pray every day. The Bible says you can pray every day and all day. So we can be ready that way. How else can we be ready? Well, being with other Christians, people who believe what we believe, so we can talk together and encourage each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things we can do to be prepared, right? But we don't want to be prepared just for that day when Jesus comes back. Because a very important thing is Jesus is here with us always. We know that. We've learned that. And so it's important for us to daily be prepared to meet him every day and all the things that we do. So yeah, we need to prepare for the future for when Jesus comes back, but we also have to prepare every day for Jesus to be a part of our lives and for us to have our relationship with him. Now, why do we do that? So we can be with the bridegroom when he comes and while he's here, right here with us now. We don't wanna miss out. We don't want to miss out on the big party celebrating and being with Jesus. Okay, so prepare this week and prepare every day to be with Jesus. Let's pray together. Bow your heads and I will pray for us, okay? Jesus, thank you for your word and it is always true, this word, and that you bring us hope so that we will continue to prepare for when you come again, but also for every day that we spend with you. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today is taken from the first uh, letter to the church in Thessalonica, and it comes in the fourth chapter, starting at about verse 13. Listen for the word of the Lord for us this day. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others grieve who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, and with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Friends, the word of the Lord for us this day. Thanks be to God. One of the cruelest realities of this season of COVID-19, this pandemic that we are living through, not only in our country, but around the world. The cruelest reality has been the number of our most senior folks, our most senior members and friends of our church, who have had to endure months of living in isolation. It has also been a cruel reality that there have been a number who have died during these times. And in our world, there has been those who had to die by themselves. I remember the time well because back in March, we had the opportunity to move my dad out of skilled nursing and back to his apartment on the campus, the senior living campus that he lived on. And it happened just in time. 
because the very day after we moved my dad back to his apartment while he was in hospice care, they shut down the skilled nursing wing, meaning that nobody could leave and nobody could be reintroduced because COVID had been introduced into the skilled nursing facility. One of the reasons that we were able to return my dad to his apartment that he missed greatly was because I agreed to be the one that would go and care for him 24 hours a day, seven days a week when that time came. And that time did come. And I went to be with my dad and it was very different living in his apartment. We weren't allowed to go out. The meals were delivered to the door by the staff, and there was kind of this arm's length exchange, trying to stay as far apart from one another as possible. My father's hospice nurse spent a great deal of time with us. And so one day I asked him, I said, why do you spend so much time with us? We enjoyed his presence, don't get me wrong. He was quiet for a moment. And then he said, because I can laugh here. When I go to skilled nursing, there are only tears behind my eyes because people are dying, not only from COVID, but they are also dying from loneliness. I went and looked up the statistics in the place where my dad lived, and on that campus they've had 20 or 122 cases, 53 of whom have been staff, and there have been 19 deaths that have been attributed to COVID. And so there was that real sense of isolation. Spouses had to be separated. They could no longer visit their loved one in skilled nursing. Families couldn't visit. And so it was very devastating for many. And there are a significant number of people who have passed away in the hospital without their loved ones being able to be present. It wasn't that family and friends didn't want to be there, wouldn't do anything within their power to be there, but the hospitals had to keep visitors out in order to fight the spread of the virus. In some cases, there were medical personnel who kept vigil with those who were dying but that wasn't always the case. And as sad as it is, we have no way of knowing what is experienced by those who are dying alone because we can't ask them what it was like. The former hospice chaplain, Carrie Egan, says that in a sense, we all die alone even if we are surrounded by people we love. Often, as we die, our bodies are breaking down and our minds are someplace else. The conscious experience of death is, by nature, solitary. Egan goes on to say, many people are not responsive at the end. Their bodies are busy doing something else. And friends, that was the experience that I had with my dad. A few days before he passed away, my sister and I noticed that there was a shift. And the things of this earth concerned him less and less and less. And the closer he got to his death, I believe the stronger sense that he had that he was going to be with his Lord and Savior. And so he lost interest in the things of this earth. There was a hymn that was written in 1922 that was popularized by Alan Jackson. And the title was, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. 
And for me, the words of that hymn gave a sense of what was going on with my dad. On Easter morning, we asked him, what was he thinking about? Because he was already in that place of shifting his attention. And my dad always loved to give a couple points and said, three points. And I can't remember the middle one. But the first one was, it is all so beautiful. And the third one was the glory of redemption. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We need to balance the reality of our discomfort, of our sometimes misplaced guilt, and we need to trust that our loved ones, that their eyes were turned towards Jesus, whether we were able to be present with them or not. That the things of this earth grew strangely dim as they were looking towards seeing Jesus face to face. We may not be able to be with our loved ones in their last moments, but we need to remember that we had the privilege of being with them in their lifetime. Some of, uh, some of this helps us understand today's reading from 1 Thessalonians. This passage of Paul's is oftentimes read as a blow-by-blow -blow description of how Jesus' return will take place. As if God had sat down and given his apostles an advanced copy of the order of the day. But friends, if we read it in that way, we miss what Paul's true concerns were. For he states what his concern is in the first passage. But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. The Apostle Paul, in his writing this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants us to be fully informed about what takes place after we die and the hope that we have that is not based on our own resources but it is a hope that is based on God's love for us. After Jesus' ascension, angels had told those who had witnessed the event that Jesus would return. And most of his disciples assumed that Jesus was coming back soon. They were expecting him at any minute. But as time passed, and as some of their brothers and sisters in Christ began to die, the surviving believers worried that the deceased would be excluded from all the benefits of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of them may have even had survivor's guilt, as well as they might have been worrying in the back of their mind that if they were to die before Christ returned, would they ex be excluded from eternity with Jesus? But as Paul writes, they shouldn't grieve as others who have no hope. He wants all who are followers of Jesus to know that God's provisions are for deceased believers in the future as an assurance of God's care for all believers, living and dead, those who existed in the past and those who exist in the present. We share in this resurrection hope. We share confidently in the expectation that what God has promised for the future will come to pass. It, it, it empowers us 
who follow Jesus to live with a different attitude about death than those who don't follow Jesus. We will still grieve the loss of a loved one who dies. We will still feel gutted if we are not able to be with our loved ones when we pass away, when they pass away. But friends, we are not without hope. We are not without hope for ourselves, and we are not without hope for them. Paul reminds his readers, those who were there 2,000 years ago, and those who have heard this reading today, that Jesus died and rose again. And thus we can count on the fact that when Jesus returns, God will bring with him those who have already died. In other words, as God has done for Jesus, so he will do for those who have died in Christ. Paul is writing out of a pastoral concern for his readers, his readers of 2,000 years ago, and his readers who have heard this very word today. He wants them to remain confident that both they and their friends and their loved ones who have been in Christ, when they die, will be reunited with Jesus. And that we will be reunited when Jesus returns. Hope is a word that we use in our everyday language. And oftentimes when we use the word hope, it is a wish that is rooted in a human desire. We hope the Packers win this weekend. That's a wish that is rooted in our human desire. But a biblical hope is very different because a biblical hope is rooted in God's love for us, it is rooted in Christ's resurrection, and it is rooted in God's faithfulness. It is rooted in God's promises to us. A biblical hope imparts a view of life beyond the end of our earthly life. And while we can't see that ourselves, we trust that God can. And based on that, our hope has an eternal perspective. That understanding enables us to count on the kingdom of God eternally, coming in all its fullness, and that we have a place in it. In this understanding, it is of supreme importance to the life of faith, because without it, we have nothing to look forward to. That beyond whatever we ourselves can make out of this life, friends, we have an eternal hope that extends far beyond our lives. It's not possible today to know exactly and literally what Paul intended about the details he gave us of Christ's return. But at a minimum, it's probably pretty clear that the rendezvous that the Apostle Paul is talking about, the image of the sky, helps his readers understand and conceptualize that when Jesus is returning, he is going to bring with him our now resurrected brothers and sisters in the faith who have passed before us, but now are with Christ. As Paul paints that picture, it is almost certain that he had a vision of the way that a king returns, a victorious king returns into the city. He probably also had in his head the apocalyptic motifs 
that oftentimes included clouds, which we can see throughout Scripture, which Paul identifies as the place where Jesus' living followers, the dead in Christ, come together to meet with God. Paul did not designate clouds as a rendezvous location simply because they were some phenomena in the sky, but because clouds have often been used throughout the Old Testament to indicate God's presence. I could list off so many of them, but we only need to remember when the Israelites escaped from Egypt and that God gave them a pillar of clouds by day to follow that signified God's presence. When Paul tells his readers that they will meet Christ in the clouds, he is saying that they will be in the presence of God the Father along with Christ. If Paul were writing to us today about our grief over those who we have lost over the last year, over the last many years in our personal lives and within the life of our church, he would probably look at some other images besides clouds to kind of mark God's presence with us. Because we have adopted clouds kind of as shorthand for troubles or worries, such as the times that we speak of looking for the silver lining in the darkest clouds. Some kind of comparison for having to exist under clouds of trouble wouldn't work. So maybe today, if Paul wanted to keep this up in the sky in that type of an image, he might choose a different sky phenomena, if you will, instead of clouds. And I wonder if he would choose sunshine, because that's our modern day metaphor for the release from or the absence of troubles. And surely, an end of time meeting with Jesus for those who are in Christ would be a release, an absence from troubles. And so Paul might want to borrow the title of a pop song from long ago, that when Christ comes, we'll be walking on sunshine. And so with that in mind, I want to read our passage from Thessalonians once again, except this time I want to read it from the message, which is a translation into a more modern day language. And instead of clouds, I have inserted sunshine in it. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those who are already dead and buried, we don't want you to be in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who have died in Jesus. And this, we can tell you with complete confidence. We have the Master's word on it, that when the Master comes again to get us, all of those who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead or leave them behind. In actual fact, they will be ahead of us. The Master himself will give the command, Archangel thunder, God's trumpets blast. He'll come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. Then 
the rest of us who were still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the sky to meet the master. Oh, we'll be walking on sunshine. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. Friends, I want to invite us to take a moment to sit before God and review those in our lives who we have lost to death. And I would give us the opportunity to thank God for their life, but more than that, to thank God for the hope that we have that is rooted in his love that we will one day see them again. And friends, I know that there are many of us who have experienced other losses during this time of COVID, whether it's looked forward to events, whether it's family celebrations that could not happen, whether it's a job that is no longer ours, whether it's a vacation we didn't get to take, whether it's the loss of a senior year in high school, the loss of a sports season, or maybe you're looking ahead to the losses that you anticipate of not being able to be together for Thanksgiving or Christmas. But I would encourage us to take a moment to ponder these losses, but then to be reminded that we have hope, a hope that is not based on anything that we can do humanly, but a hope that God will heal our losses, that God will heal our grief. And while we may not be able to go back and regain or recapture, that God will bring new things into our lives, and that one day, even now, that we can walk on sunshine once again. And then in a few moments, our worship team will lead us out of the silence.
Friends, would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Holy God, we confess that we place way too much hope in our political system and its leaders. Holy God, we confess that we get way too riled up over that which we can't control, and we become complacent about that which we can control. God, sometimes in the midst of bitter disagreement, of discord in our nation, we can fail to live up to your high calling of a faith in Jesus Christ. And so, God, let us be reminded once again from the words that are found in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9, of what you, how you call us to live as followers of Jesus Christ. Holy God, may we let our love be genuine. May we abhor what is evil. May we hold fast to what is good. May we become great at loving one another with affection. Make us great at outdoing one another in showing honor. Make us great in our fervor of spirit to serve the Lord. Make us great in hope. Make us great in patience during tribulation. Make us great in our consistency of prayer. Make us great in our contributions towards the saints. Make us great in showing hospitality. Make us great in blessing those who persecute us. Make us great in rejoicing with those who rejoice. Make us great at weeping with those who weep. Make us great at living in harmony with one another. Make us great at repaying no one evil for evil. Make us great living peaceably with all. Make us great at feeding the hungry, even if they are an enemy. Make us great at not being overcome by evil, but make us great at overcoming evil with good. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught his followers to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it is always a joy in the life of the church when we have the privilege and opportunity to baptize a child into the church of Jesus Christ. And even though we are not gathered together physically as a community of faith, and we are separated by distance, that we are still bound together by the Holy Spirit, and we trust that as we baptize Atlas today, that the Holy Spirit is present, and that the Holy Spirit is connecting us to one another. Hear the words of Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. In baptism, God claims us and puts a sign on us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ by his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, 
joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember and rejoice in our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. Chris and Chantel, I'd invite you to come forward to the baptismal font. Would you please introduce yourself to the congregation? Hi, I'm Chantel. Um, I used to work here down in the nursery when I was in college. Um, I really enjoyed all of the people that I met, all the families that I worked with, and I'm really excited and looking forward to joining the church. Uh, my name is Chris and uh, Chantel's husband. And uh, when she told me about coming to the congregation here and how welcome and, and warming the congregation was, I was very excited to um, come back to the family again. Chris and Chantel, do you affirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? I do. I do. And do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf as you do your own? Do you look to Christ for your child's salvation as you do your own? Do you? I do. And do you now unreservedly promise in humble reliance on God's grace to set before your child an example of new life in Christ? Do you? I do. And do you promise to pray with and for your child and to bring your child up in the knowledge and love of God? Do you? I do. And now I would invite the clerk of our session Linda Jawson to come and ask the question of the congregation. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of First Presbyterian Church, promise to tell this child the good news of the gospel, to help him know that all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen their family ties with the household of God. Do you? We do. And on behalf of all the congregation, we do. Water is a powerful symbol throughout the scripture. Water reminds us of God's love, faithfulness, cleansing, and rebirth. <laughs> Would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water, that this baptismal font may be the beginning of new birth. May all who pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind them to the household of faith. Guard them from all evil. Strengthen them to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. What is the Christian name of this child? Atlas James. Atlas James, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May you come to know Jesus early in your life, and may you serve him all of your days. And all God's people said, we are witnesses. Chris and Chantel, as a church, we would like to give Atlas a handmade blanket as a sign of our commitment as a church to nurture and embrace him as he grows. We would also like to give your family a first baby Bible so that he can be, you can begin reading stories of the Bible to him. He's very precious, and our hope is that he will always feel comfort and warmth here at our church, and that this, peace will, this place will be a peace for him, and he will feel a part of this church family. Blessings on your whole family. The one part that I really miss about doing baptism in this way 
is it's always a joy to take a child and walk them around the congregation and introduce them to the congregation, to those who might teach in Sunday school or lead in VBS, or those who might volunteer with youth ministry or even help lead a mission trip in the life of our church. But when we baptize an infant or a child, we as a church make a commitment to support this family, to nurture their faith, and to remember them in our prayers. And so I would encourage us already to be participating in that vow and remembering this family in our prayers in this week. Thank you. as we leave this place of worship, may we go with our eyes fixed on Jesus' wonderful face. For we pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.